Hi, and thank you for coming to my session. This talk is about a phrase I invented, low context DevOps. Low context DevOps is a way of thinking about how our SRE or DevOps team shares information. When we lower or reduce the required context to do our job, our job becomes easier. We get more efficient, we're more productive, and heck, we create a less frustrating workplace. I borrow concepts from sociologists who study this kind of thing. And well, by the end of this talk, we'll have a roadmap for improving how your team works together thanks to low context techniques. I want to improve two situations in particular. First, think about a time when you were blocked because you didn't know how to do something and the coworker you could ask wasn't around. That's frustrating, right? A typical engineer spends hours each week blocked that way. I wanna reduce that problem for you and your team. I also want to improve productivity in another way too. I know that if I do something five times in a row, I'll be much better at it, at that task the fifth time. That's just normal, right? But wouldn't it be great if what I learned benefited the entire team, not just myself? In an ideal world, every time anyone on the team learns anything, the entire team would have access to that knowledge too. That's what this talk's about. Let's begin. So as far as introductions are concerned, my name's Tom Lomicelli. I manage the SRE teams at Stack Overflow. I've been a sysman for much too long. I blog and I tweet, and I've written a number of books on system administration and SRE topics. As I mentioned before, I work at Stack Overflow. I think you've probably heard of Stack Overflow. Billions of page views uh, you know, a year, millions of users. In fact, demographers tell us that there are about 20 million software engineers in the world. And so we have 100 million users, which means every time you meet two software engineers, five of them use our website. And uh, you've probably heard of Stack Overflow, but you might not have heard of Stack Overflow for Teams. Now, I'm not here to sell anything, but I just want to mention Stack Overflow for Teams gives you that Q&A experience of Stack Overflow for your private organization in a, in a secure manner. Okay, so this talk has three parts, high and low context cultures, um, sociology term, and we're going to talk about low context DevOps, the term I created, and we're going to end by talking a little about leadership. So part one, high and low context cultures. Begin with a story. Um, this man is traveling in a foreign land and he comes across a village and he goes to the first shopkeeper and the shopkeeper won't talk to him. He goes into the second shop. That shopkeeper won't talk to him either. Well, he goes back out to the street and he's trying to figure out what to do. You know, did I mess up? Did I, you know, what, what, what's going on here? And a little boy walks up to him and says, Mr. I can tell you why they won't talk to you. When you arrive at a village, first you have to visit the elders and they'll give you their blessing and, and, and then you can go about your business. And he's like, oh, thank you so much. So he, he goes and he does that and, uh, and it works. He, after getting the elder's blessing, he, he goes to the different shops and, and, and everyone will talk to him. Well, that night he's thinking to himself, how the heck was I supposed to know this? Ironically, the little boy at the same time was in his home thinking about his day and he was just thinking, oh, how could that guy not have known that? Okay, story number two is about Stack Overflow. I started working in Stack Overflow about seven years ago. About four days in, five days in, my mentor was teaching me uh, this process, something uh, every sysman does commonly, like you know, setting up a new machine. And this was a very complicated process and, and it wasn't written down either. So he's explaining this to me and I'm struggling to, to take notes. And uh, we get to the end of the process and I said, uh, I'm surprised this isn't written down anywhere. And he says, oh, well, you know, I've figured anyone who could pass our, uh, anyone who could pass our interview process should be able to, to do this kind of thing. And um, that didn't make sense to me because, I mean, one of the steps, I had to know the IP address of a certain machine. Another step, he showed me that they don't use the default on a certain setting because certain, um, certain hardware they use, uh, that doesn't work well. And, uh, you know, so that night I'm sitting at home and I'm thinking, how could I have not, how could I have known these things? And I wonder to this day, you know, maybe he was sitting in his home thinking, 
man, we hired this guy that wrote all these Sisman books. How could he have not known these things? Yeah. Now, here's the, the funny postscript to this story is the next day I get a call from my boss and he says, hey, did you do the thing? And I said, yeah. He said, well, you didn't add this uh, certain information to our inventory. Now, you could be the best sysadmin in the world. And how would you know that this company keeps this inventory off to the side? Um, and it's kind of a punchline because think about it. I didn't know I was the new person, but it's also the my mentor who is teaching me this, he also didn't uh, didn't remember to uh, to include that. Okay, so um, so these are examples of high context cultures. A high context culture is where communication is implicit. It's not so written down. It's more like, you know, we've been around long enough that you just know, right? There's a lot of reading between the lines and in high context cultures also. And, uh, you know, long history of relationship, right? If you've been with someone a long time, you, you develop these, these kind of things. So for example, if you have a party with friends, you probably have a bunch of in jokes that a new person coming to that party might not understand. That's a high context culture. Compare that to a low context culture. A low context culture is where communication is explicit. There are rules, you're told the rules, they're written down so that you always know what those rules are. Knowledge is codified in this way. It's public, it's external, it's accessible. And this works best in environments where people have to get up to speed really quickly. So for example, at a large airport, you're not gonna be there for a long time. So they strive to make airports low context, right? There's lots of signage. There's, um, you know, you're told what to do. There's people standing around so that uh, to give you help if you need it. Linguists who study this, uh, or sociologists who study this, find that certain languages have a, a certain amount of context built in. Asian languages are known for having uh, being high context languages. There's a lot that's kind of reading between the lines. Low context languages are much more explicit. Let me tell you another story. Uh, this is this is one of my favorite high context environments. This is this is Penn Station in New York City. Now, normally I, I, I live in New Jersey. I work in New York City at Stacks headquarters. And so I commute through Penn Station twice a day. And Penn Station is a very high context environment. Um, I mean, here's, here's a map. Uh, this, this map is uh, useless in my mind. The, the first and second floor are different sizes. They don't overlay properly. I think the only people that understand this map are people that already know Penn Station. And who needs a map? Everybody else. Right? I mean, when there's a lost tourist that asks me for directions, usually, I mean, I know the layout really well, and I can't explain how to get from one place to another to a tourist. If, if I'm asked for directions, I will often just walk the person there or walk them halfway there and point them uh, for the remaining segment. It's that complicated. Um, but this is my favorite part of Penn Station, uh, this sign right here. Um, if you notice, it says uh, to the left is the Seventh Avenue subway. This is the most high context sign I can imagine because to understand this sign, here's the context you need to know. You need to know that 30 years ago, they changed the name of the Seventh Avenue subway and it's now called the 123 line, right? So this sign only makes sense to people that have a 30 year history of Penn Station in their head. And I, um, I, I laugh and I think, well, you know, this sign, uh, it's kind of in this obscure hallway. Not a lot of people are going to see it. But then I, I thought about it one day and I realized, see, that sign's lit up. There's a light bulb behind that sign. Light, light bulbs don't last 30 years. Someone has been changing this light bulb for 30 years and they are not empowered to tell their boss, hey, we need to replace this sign. Okay. Part two of my talk, low context DevOps. I'm gonna make this assertion. A DevOps or SRE environment should be low context. And I hope you agree. We should spend more time working, doing technical work, less time frustrated with roadblocks and information gaps and wondering, you know, how could I have known that? But most of all, we shouldn't just change the light bulb. We should fix the damn sign. So 
there's three ways you can reduce the required context of your DevOps environment. Uh, or three that we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> Carefully constructed defaults, making write easy, and ubiquitous documentation. So carefully construct the defaults. What does this mean? Um, well, let me give you an example. Uh, at most companies, when you hire a new employee, they need three things to be able to do their job. They, they need a PC or workstation of some sort. They need the software required to do their job. And they need access and permission to the various systems required to do their job. At a lot of companies, it's weeks before a new employee is able to do their job because they have these three things. In fact, one of my coworkers previously worked at a bank and he said it's six months before, it, it was six months before he was able to do his job because it took that long to get all the access and permissions that were needed. This is incredibly inefficient. You're, you're paying new employees full salary while they are unable to do work. That's, that's not efficient. And, and this isn't just a new employee thing. I mean, think about it. We change projects frequently nowadays. If it takes you six months to get up to speed on a project and projects only last one year, that's not super efficient, right? We want to make this better. And why does this stay broken? Well, new employees can't fix it, right? You're you're the new person. You, you're not empowered to, uh, to make big changes. And um, experienced employees that maybe do have the, you know, that are empowered to fix it, they don't feel the pain. So there's no like, you know, why are they going to fix it? And also it's hard. It's really, really hard. It requires working across silos. I mean, getting, you know, some of these fixed, it requires working across IT, InfoSec, engineering, even HR. And, you know, we went to, uh, you know, we have a technical background mostly, you know, we, we went to school for engineering, not for hostage negotiation, right? These are really hard problems to fix. But if you don't do it, who will? So uh, there's a new book out by Gene Kim, The Unicorn Project. If you're familiar with The Phoenix Project, this is the sequel. It takes place in the same universe. And he dives deep into fixing this problem. Uh, and thankfully, uh, because of that, I'm not going to talk too much about this, this topic. Just read that book. It's awesome. Number two, we can make right easy. So. Fundamentally, we want the lazy path to guide you to the right way or the recommended way of doing something, right? Leverage the power of laziness. We want to set up our coworkers so that they fall into a pit of success. Here's some examples. Uh, let's talk about OpenSSL. Uh, this is the software technology that's behind a lot of the uh, security or cryptographic systems that you use. So when you go to uh, HTTPS instead of HTTP and you get you know an encrypted connection to that website, there's a good chance that it's OpenSSL that's doing a lot of the work there. Now, if you've ever programmed using OpenSSL, it's difficult. You need a freaking PhD in cryptography to, to get everything just right. And once you do get everything right, six months later, you're wrong again because Things in crypto change, right? And now you have to re, you know, you have to stay, keep up with all those changes and constantly be fixing your, or changing your open SSL stuff. It's 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 really difficult. Compare that to Libra SSL. They forked the open SSL code a couple of years ago, and their concept was that the default should be timelessly correct. They made a new API that um, I don't think they use this phrase, but I, I call this like their lazy API. If you just want to accept an SSL connection or create an SSL connection, just use this function. It's a very familiar API. It looks like um, you're uh, reading and writing to a file. And the default is timelessly correct. It is the best uh, crypto settings uh, or best practices of crypto settings that you can imagine. That's how I want everything in the world to be. So. For example, at uh, Stack Overflow, our CI CD pipeline, we try to embody those recommended practices so that if you just go with the defaults, you get the best practices, right? Sure, you could do things differently, but that would be extra work. And we want to leverage the power of laziness. You know who also really understands this well? Uh, Squarespace. I was talking to some engineers at Squarespace, and they tackled a very interesting problem. They said, we knew that we needed to hire a whole lot of engineer, uh, software engineers. And it's hard enough to find a good developer, but it's even harder to find a developer that uh, is good at coding and understands how to write code that's that's operable, right? You know, code that 
works well in operations. You know, has that uh, the the important monitoring things and and all all the various things that SREs need to see in code. So what they did is they said, let's make the lazy path the easy path uh, or the right path. So they um, their code links to a base library that institutes telemetry collection for monitoring, standardized flags, all that different stuff. So even if you were just hired and writing a simple hello world web server, you're going to get all that monitoring, all those good operational things that we want to see in code. So they made the lazy path the right path. Awesome. And we can do this for all of our foundational tools, from our ticket system to our source control system to you know, the CIC to pipeline, et cetera. We want to um, engineer things so that they uh, they exude you know, our recommended practices. Next topic, ubiquitous documentation. OK, one more story. Um, this is Paddington Station. Have you ever been to Paddington Station? You might have if you uh, if you fly to Heathrow Airport and take the train into London. Uh, this is where you probably end up. Paddington Station is a beautiful station, and um, I I arrived there a couple years ago. And you know the first thing I thought was, well, now I need to find a taxi cab. So I um, was about to ask someone when I looked down at my feet and I saw this. Let, let me zoom in. I thought this was brilliant. This is the epitome of good documentation. It's the right amount of documentation at the right time and place, right? It's certainly at the right time and place. I mean, it was at my feet when I got off the train. Cool. Um, and it's the right amount. It's just taxi and an arrow. You don't need more. You don't need less. You don't need the Wikipedia history of taxi cabs. You don't need you know any less. So um, I walked along that line, as many other tourists were, and I got to the taxi stand. Perfect. So we want to embody that kind of thing in our SRE environment. We, we want docs where you need them, when you need them. And you know this used to be a lot harder. I, nowadays, we could just include a URL to the documentation all over the place, right? I mean, this was a lot harder before URLs. I, I, I've been around long enough to remember a time before URLs. And, you know, it's it's hard to tell people where a document is um, back then. Anyway, so um, you know we can put these you know deep linked URLs in um, in our error messages, in our CI/CD control panel, in in alert messages. You know anywhere people might be stuck and need information. You know who understands this really well? Apple. Did you upgrade to a Catalina a Mac OS Catalina? They they changed the default shell from Bash to Z shell in the terminal. And now, um, uh, when you open a terminal window, if you're set to the old shell, you get this message. It's very concise. We've made a change. Here's how you can change your system to be up to date. And if you need more information, here's the URL. It's perfect amount of information in the right time in the right place. They could have just put that on their website someplace, but someone thought to put it in the right place at the right time. So let's talk about creating a culture of ubiquitous documentation. I mean, fundamentally, this is this is going to do more for your um, low context environment than anything else. And creating a culture of ubiquitous documentation requires effort all over the place, from, uh, from, from management all the way down. Management has to set expectations. Set the expectation that it's not done until it's documented, and not not just on big projects, but on little things. You know, every little ticket that you close, uh, every bug that you fix, should probably also involve updating the documentation. And I don't mean uh, you know writing a twenty-page you know paper. I just mean uh, you know updating that paragraph so that it's a little more accurate, or including an example command so that the next person that solves a similar uh, ticket. Um, they have the exact command to type, or or just paste in the the command you used and tell them you know, modify as needed, and maybe the next person can update that um, to be a, a more generic command. Uh, and over time, things will the documentation will will improve. Um, management should also treat bugs uh, in documentation just like bugs in software. You should. Um, be encourage people to file bugs about documentation. In some environments, you're not allowed to file bugs about documentation. I think that's weird. 
Um, no, you want to be able to file bugs, and those bugs should go through the same triaging system that uh, and workflow that all your software bugs go through. And this is how we create a culture of you know updating as you work. Um, I have a, an article in the ACM called Manual Work is a Bug that talks a lot about this. You want to be updating the documentation in small increments. Uh, you know, always be always be updating the docs. Don't think of it as something that you do at the end of a project. And we have to fight the usual excuses that you'll get. You know, a developer once told me, my code is the documentation. Well, well, then at a minimum, we need documentation that points you to the code, right? So you need to come up with good answers to these, um, uh, these things that people say. If you need some inspiration personally for writing documentation, the number one thing I think about is I document so that I can relax while I'm on vacation. How many people here have had uh, have delayed a vacation because they were afraid that like, what if something goes wrong and I'm needed? Or or what if, you know, how many people have, it's been years since you've taken a vacation where you're uh, actually disconnected from the internet, you know, on a, you know, a, a cruise or, I don't know, climbing a mountain or in some place where there's no internet access. Um, you're, if you're restricting where you can go on vacation because, uh, because you think you can't, um, think about documentation as a solution to that problem. Some people I talk to say, Tom, docs, what docs? Our company has no docs. This is this is what our docs look like. OK, if you have no docs, um, maybe you need to um, talk about talk with your coworkers about um, how, do, how are we going to overcome this? Um, I think one of the biggest issues there is that a lot of people just don't like to write documentation. Um, I don't like to write documentation. I've written many books and I don't like to write. I mean, I, I like having been, I like having uh, having written a book. I don't like writing the book. Like it's great when it's in the past tense. Um, so let's talk about why people avoid writing documentation. Um, I'd like to talk about three reasons that I think people don't write documentation. The first is uncertain scope. You sit down to write and you start wondering like, what's the scope of this? Do I, do I have to write like the two paragraphs that are gonna record something that happened this morning? Or do I have to write 20 pages? You know, do I have to write, you know, the history of, of, of this? Um, and they get flustered and they decide, well, I'm not gonna write, I'll, I'll, I'll write tomorrow, right? They put it off. Another thing is uncertain audience. Like who's gonna be reading this? Is it uh, a coworker that is experienced uh, and I can be brief? Or do I have to explain like every little thing? Is this is the audience, you know, someone who just got hired or a, a very junior uh, engineer? And it's and so you say, well, maybe I'll write it for both audiences, and that becomes frustrating because now you're it, it's hard to 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 do that, and you give up and you say, oh, I'm I'm just not going to write, or I'll write tomorrow, right? And then there's this third thing. This third thing is the blank screen syndrome. The blank screen syndrome is just you know, you're staring at this screen and you're trying to figure out where, where do I get started, right? It's super intimidating. It's 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 the combination of those other two problems and more. And the blank screen syndrome is everywhere. I mean, look, I mean, here's a blank screen syndrome in Vim, uh, in Microsoft Word. Uh, it exists even in Notepad for you more junior engineers or you know, you more sophisticated, fancy people with Sublime or you know, you're more. I'm gonna be trendy. I mean, it's 2020. We have to have dark mode, blank screen. Yeah, um, the blank screen syndrome, while not a medically recognized condition, is a very real problem. So let's talk about how we get through the blank screen syndrome. Well, I have one very simple answer, and that is really awesome templates. If you can create a template for certain situations, you're gonna eliminate that blank screen syndrome because, well, the screen isn't blank. You have a bunch of headings that you can fill out. So for example, at Stack, any internal service that we run has to have a service doc. And this just lists you know, uh, some fundamental information about the service. And we have a template. So there's, uh, uh, you know, and you can fill it out. Uh, you can leave certain sections blank. Um, you can, you know, incrementally or, you know, iterate do small batch writing. You know, I'm going to fill out the first couple sections, leave the other sections for later. Um, my sample template for this is in one of my books. Um, the other uh, template that I'm very fond of is the alert doc template. So every time I get paged, 
um, that alert has a URL that points to a, an alert doc that tells you about the, the failure condition and how to resolve that kind of issue. And writing those, again, we have a template. It makes it super easy. So um, fundamentally, uh, a lot of these things are, are getting down to writing in small batches. I mentioned before, we want to write in small increments or iterative writing. Uh, fundamentally, this is, this is uh, small batch writing. Uh, don't try to sit down and write uh, you know, a 100-page book that's going to be done next year. Because for the next 11 months, people are going to be without information. It's better, I, I would rather see people write, you know, one sentence a day and ship that one sentence, you know, in our doc repo, um, because uh, then you you have that information. It's, it's available, it's usable, and it's a lot simpler. And also that 100-page document, you're never going to find the time to write it. So that's basically saying we're not going to write any documentation. But when you write in small batches, lots of little iterations, that documentation gets done. Another thing you can do is include your documentation updates in work estimates. Um, where I work, the people I manage, I say, don't tell me that this project is a three-day project plus one day to update the documentation. That's a four-day project. When we talk about documentation as something that's bolted on at the end, then we're just giving ourselves an excuse to not write that documentation, right? Things are gonna get busy and we're not gonna, we're gonna save time by not writing the documentation. Or worse, or actually even better, is um, I think our documentation is better when we write along the way. Instead of saving it to the end, always be updating that documentation. The last thing I want to recommend is um, find out where your engineers are already writing and repurpose that text, right? A lot of engineers say, oh, I hate writing documentation. But then they'll send you email with a long explanation of how something works. Well, what I do in that case is I pay them the best compliment I can think of. I say, hey, that's a great explanation. Would you do me a favor and paste that into our doc repo someplace so that everyone can have access to that, right? So I'm taking where people are already writing, email, chat, instant message, and, um, and leveraging that and using that all over the place. So you know where else engineers like to write? Stack Overflow. You knew I was going to say that, right? And I think the reason for this is we have uh, we've come through a lot of these uh, a lot of the issues that I talked about. You know, there's a specific scope, right? You've get you're given the question. You only have to write enough to answer that question. The audience is clear. The audience is the person who asked the question. Sure, you can add more, but you know, you can guess. You can you can look at that question and ascertain or make a good guess on their experience level, and you could write to that experience level. Um, and it has templates, as wizards, for asking good questions, for answering questions well. And um, one another, you know, that leads me back to uh, Stack Overflow for Teams. And, you know, I, I'm not a salesperson, but I do want to say that um, I'm super happy with uh, this new product. Um, we've had a lot of success. and. Um, and for a number of good reasons. I mean, new employees know how to use it because they probably used Stack Overflow themselves. Um, experienced employees, uh, they love it too. I've seen, um, uh, I heard that we, there's one engineer at a bank, he maintains the authentication library for all the software used or written in, in his company. And it's kind of a lonely job. He never hears much from people other than uh, you know complaints and the occasional bug. But when they got Stack Overflow for Teams, um, he made a, a tag for his library, and people started tagging questions with that tag when, when they were asking questions about his library. And now he can just subscribe to that tag. So he sees every question that comes up related to that. And it's like he has a fan base, and he, he has a, this morning ritual where he goes out and finds all the new questions and answers them. And, and he feels like he's helping people so much more than ever before. So this leads us to the third and last section of this talk, leadership. I've talked about a lot of things today, a lot of different techniques, a lot of different cultural changes. Who's going to make those changes happen in your organization? It's got to be you. Now, <clears throat> I gave this talk recently, and someone afterwards said, Tom, uh, these changes are great, but I'm not a manager. I can't make these changes. So you don't have to be a manager. Manager, you have to be a leader. So let's let's 
be clear, there's a difference between management and leadership. A manager is an HR designation. It's something in the org chart. Managers, you know, they, they, they're in charge of setting priorities, providing resources, and clearing roadblocks. And if you don't want to go into management, that's fine. I'm not saying you have to go into management. What I'm encouraging you to do is become a leader, and everyone can be a leader. Everyone can be a leader whether you just got hired or if you've been there for years. If you're a junior person or a senior engineer, everyone can be a leader because leadership is about two things. It's going first and making it easy for others to follow, right? So going first, you set up that documentation repo. How do you make it easy for others to follow? You create templates for service docs and alerts. Going first, you set up the CI CD system, or maybe just the first iteration of what it's going to look like. You make it other, easy for others to follow by making sure that that workflow has the lazy path be the right path. And if you do those things, you can be a leader. And it's very similar to the children's game, follow the leader, right? The person up front, what are they doing? They're doing those two things. They're going first, that's kind of obvious, but they're making it easy for others to follow, right? They're making those decisions. Are we going to go around that big rock or go over? Are we going to hop over that stream or are we going to walk over to the bridge, right? They've made those decisions to make it easy for everyone else to follow. Okay, so in summary, DevOps environments should strive to be low context. I hope you agree to that. And we discussed a number of ways we can make this happen. Smart defaults, for example, making the employee environment such that we accelerate how fast new hires are productive. We talked about making right easy. The lazy path should fulfill the re recommended practices. And this is something we should do for all of our foundational tools. And three, ubiquitous documentation. We need to create a culture of documentation with management support where we all write in small batches, little iterations, not you know big batch writing. Um, and we can take uh, inspiration by, you know, uh, think about you know making your next vacation less stressful. Um, why don't we write documentation? Well, there's the burden of audience and scope and the blank screen syndrome. And how are we going to fix that? Templates, templates, templates. Encourage people to repurpose the text from places that they already write, like email or Stack Overflow, and put all that documentation in a central resource. And it would please me very much if you considered Stack Overflow teams as that resource. So that's my time. I hope you enjoyed my talk. And please, don't keep changing the light bulb. Fix the sign. Thank you.